welcome to We Believe, a consideration of religious beliefs and God's Word, examined in conversation by James F. Walsh, an attorney and Roman Catholic deacon, and Dr. Richard Shriver, United Methodist minister and professor of theology. Each discussion embraces carefully chosen subjects selected in an effort to deepen your religious awareness in the sincere hope that We Believe will help provide a bridge of understanding among all the children of God. Welcome to We Believe, another show in the series on the sacraments. And Jim, this My time pleasure. I get to say welcome to you. Right, it's and your show this time. I have the podium and it makes me feel so good. You're going the to only... talk about the sacrament, the Protestant sacrament of penance, although there isn't one. <laughs> That's going to We're be all... good. I want to hear this. <laughs> yeah, how do we there talk about penance one, from maybe. a Protestant point of view yeah. and Protestants don't know what that word uh, means? At least the know? sacrament of penance. Yeah. Probably the closest that the Protestant would be clear about on it, because it is a vacuum in yeah. our heritage, yeah. uh, would be repent. You know, that has the same root yeah, word, sure. you know. Uh, repentance. Or, yeah. And the word punishment uh, mm -hmm. comes from that same root word, but it mm -hmm. has to do with uh, our sin and seeking God's forgiveness for it. Well, I'm interested to see what you do with this. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, of course, don't have the sacrament of penance in, in Protestantism. You've got confession, and I think you know that I think that when Protestantism threw out the sacrament of penance and the act of confession and the priest priest role as... Mm -hmm. uh, as re confessor. As confessor, yeah. Mm -hmm. That we threw the baby out of the bathwater... And uh, one comment I want to make at the beginning and is, is that, you know, I feel like when we look back through church history, that up until 1517, 1521, the Protestant Reformation, that your heritage and my heritage are the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that uh, there was the one church up to the Protestant Reformation. Then we split, and my heritage goes this way and yours goes that way. You're the modern Catholic church. I happen to be a Methodist. And not all Protestants would agree with that statement. Oh, I, I, I suspect yeah. that's true. But my point is that, that really when we, when we Protestants criti criticize the Catholic church, it's like criticizing your mother. Mm. I uh, think you know, so. And, I and, agree. and literally we're talking about the mother church, which yeah. is the church that as early as 55 or 60 A.D. had its center in Rome. It mm -hmm. moved from Jerusalem to Rome. Yeah. And so when I say that during the Middle Ages, I perceive as I study history that there were some corruptions that developed in the church. I'm talking about my church mm -hmm. as well as your church. And it's not a criticism of your Roman Catholic church today at all. Now what Protestants perceive happened whether it did or not. And he's going to, folks, he's going to argue with me about this as to whether it really in truth happened. Protestants do perceive that the Catholic, oh, they're the ones that can go to confession on Saturday, get cleansed of, forgiven of their sins, and then go to Mass, you know, so they're ready for Mass to take communion, and then go out and do it again. Yeah. And over and over and over and over again. Uh, and you're going to point out in a few minutes that that really is a misunderstanding yeah of the sacrament it, it of penance. Would, would be an abuse. Yeah. And I will leave that for you to explain. All right. But my point would be that that is a possibility. Mm -hmm. That when we perceive we can go and have and confess our sins, whether it be in a Catholic church with a confessor priest or whether it be on a mourner, mourner's bench in a Protestant church where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I, I'm sorry to God, I won't ever do it again mm -hmm. knowing full well I will that that's one of the dangers of this Christian promise of forgiveness based on the eternal love of God. Mm -hmm. Now there's another side of it where we Protestants are certainly more guilty than Catholics. And that is through a misunderstanding, I think, of Christian doctrine and particularly the writings of Paul. One of the things that Protestants quite often do is talk about repent, believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. Now I think the words themselves certainly have a basic truth. 
but generally I think that they are misrepresented and, and it um, becomes an abuse. Now, that's, now me, that, that's scripture, though, isn't it? I mean, believe on yeah, Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. Based upon particularly the third chapter of Romans, Paul's letter mm -hmm. to the Romans, where he says, All have sinned mm -hmm. and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified, meaning all have sinned, mm -hmm. are justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now, let me tell you what I think Paul's, Paul meant by that. And I think this is a very difficult idea, and so we're going to batter it back mm -hmm. and forth. But what I perceive Paul to be saying is that when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, it was for the sins of the world. And that that act accomplished the salvation of the world. Now, well, that's, that's I true, think, that's you know, true. I think that that's what Paul meant. And I think the proof of the pudding about that is, what does Paul do when he comes to that realization but spend the rest of his life looking at the world and saying, Jesus has done this for us and nobody knows it. And so the obsession of Paul is to go out and tell the world, God loves you. And the reaction they have is this hungry world reacts to this by saying, you know, this is the good news, mm -hmm. the gospel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it is that Christ has saved the world from its sin. And the point being, we're saved by God's grace, not by our works. Now, that's Paul's well, that's, point. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the word comes in faith, and that's where I have a problem with this, believe on Jesus Christ and be saved. I don't know how you beat yourself over the head mm -hmm. to believe something you don't believe. Mm -hmm. And what I think Paul is trying to say and the abuse of it, you see, is a matter of understanding. What I think Paul is really trying to say is, God has given us this grace. We've got it. It has happened. It has been accomplished. We have been given salvation. We don't know it. Somebody's got to tell us, you know, and that's the role of the church and, and people like Paul. But that that gift is there. And part of the gift is freedom, that there is no fellowship with God unless we're free to say, no, we don't want fellowship with God. Just like if you're marrying uh, your wife, if you make her marry you, you're not going to have much of a marriage. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if it's two people who come together freely in love, which mm -hmm. is what Christianity is about, yeah. then, uh, then there is the chance for the Christian fellowship. And that 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 freedom that is the right to reject and the ability to choose God and receive Him into your heart, that's the faith act. It's based on freedom, not upon mental consent so much as on our freedom to choose. And uh, uh, now, react Let, let me that. respond. First of all, Richard, uh, you're making a, a very subtle point, it seems to me, one that's not easy to Would understand. Would you believe I've been working on it for 40 years <laughs> trying to right. come up with something? Let me give you the Catholic explanation, and you tell me if this is the same thing that you're saying, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. One, you said Jesus Christ died on the cross for the salvation of all people, that his infinite gift giving to the infinite God merited for us eternal salvation, all of us. Mm-hmm. I believe, and I think the church teaches, that God wills the salvation of all people, which is kind of what you said. Salvation is there, okay? You've got something you do about baptism. Hey, hang, on, now, hang on, hang on, hang on, wait. But the person must respond through God's grace. In other words, God's grace is always there. His hands are always out to receive. We're surrounded. He will not, he, no one ever loses heaven because God wills him to go to hell. He loses heaven because he rejects the grace, the help he receives from God. Now, there's a mystery. Why is it that some reject it and some accept it? And it's a mystery for a Catholic and it's a mystery for a Methodist. Now, if you don't mind me moving to another little area here, it is not mystery for a Calvinist. That's right. He I, solved I, it. I saw you going yeah. there. Now, he solved it, but see what that does to God. 
This person is saved because God wills him to be saved. This person is saved damned. is damned because God wills him to be damned. That solves the mission. Yeah. That's called predestination, but it makes God kind of a monster in my view. We, you as a Methodist, me as a Catholic, we believe in freedom of the will, but we don't know why some do and some don't. And we could, so they debated this in the Middle Ages, yeah. we could sit here. Do we have the same view of this? Yeah, the thing that I'm trying to show is yeah. that, the, that the word faith yeah. that Paul uses, yeah. meaning the instrument through which God gives his grace, yeah. he offers it to everyone. Yeah. And it's, it comes through our faith that that faith is involved in this choice, this, which is a gift, not yeah. a condition. Yeah. In other words, we don't... Well, let me give you another example. You like these examples. Okay, all right. Uh, here's a Christmas tree. All right. And everyone in the world has a gift under it, wrapped with their name on it. Okay. That's right. what I perceive to be what happened with the Christ act on the cross. Right, but we have to go pick it up. Well... It's been given. It's no longer sure. God's, it's ours. That's right. Sure. You know? it's, it's out there for us. And when you give a gift, you know, then it's the person's. And they can do with what they wish. Mm -hmm. They can open it up. They can throw it in they the trash. They can throw it away. They That's can say, right. I don't want this. That's right. And I think that there are a lot of things, you know, we're also set in a precarious world where none of us get the same dose. But Richard, I think, and we can talk about this too in the discussion question, if I were people out there listening... When you say, believe on Jesus Christ, accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, is, is that wrong? I, I mean, I don't I'm know. saying it's not the mental consent that Paul is talking about. It's not something that you can hammer yourself over the head to do. And that I think that gets distorted, particularly in Protestantism, often in evangelization is your mm -hmm. word, evangelism is ours. Yeah. Uh, I think it gets distorted into thinking that all I have to do is say, I believe and well, I'm saved. Well, yeah, and, uh, and, and yeah. that's not it. That turns the whole thing upside down. What Paul's saying is, you are saved. Yeah. The salvation's well, there, it's yours. The gift's it, under it, the tree. We, we must then work our, our salvation out. Doesn't Paul say somewhere in fear and trembling? I mean, oh, we got to work at it every and, day. And you know, why would Paul spend his life traveling through awful conditions the rest of his life, traveling, you know, on ships, shipwrecks, mm. robbers, uh, pestilence, all sorts of problems, dedicated to this idea because it makes a difference mm. if you know you are loved by God. Getting back to the other points you made in your earlier presentation, you said that this, this gift was abused by the church uh, Clarify that a little bit, and maybe we can take it up again in the question session. That's not, you may want to say a little more on that. I think that, I, I think that, and this happens more in Protestantism mm -hmm. than in, in the Catholic Church, because we get all tied up in evangelism mm -hmm. and think that we've got to save the world that's already saved. I think that's one of the problems. Mm -hmm. The world is saved and doesn't know it. What we've got to do is the messenger to, 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 it makes a difference when you know God loves you. Mm. It make, it's all the difference in the world. And that the task of the church is to be the messenger, to carry this message, but the salvation's there. That's what Paul did all his life. That's right, yeah. that's right. And, uh, and the, the abuse is to make people think that they're going to hell and that that's God's plan. Oh, and you I don't see. get, you know, it's this idea, all you got to do is join my church and oh, believe the right things or you're going to hell. This gets us That's back a terrible to abuse. some of the discussions we had on mm -hmm. baptism. Yeah. Uh, well, we've got a lot to kick around in the, uh, in the question and answer period. Right. And so. Well, I think this is a good time for our break, and right. uh, so let's do, and we'll come back, and Pat, I understand, is going to be with us to Great. moderate some questions. Great. Thank you. Today's We Believe program is brought to you by a grant from your local Knights of Columbus Council. Founded by Father Michael McGivney, the Knights of Columbus began when a few men gathered in a church hall in 1882. Today, the Knights of Columbus has a membership of over one and a half million men with local councils spanning the globe. 
The Knights of Columbus is a fraternal service order of Catholic men dedicated to providing support to the individual, the family, and the community. The principles of the order are charity, unity, fraternity, and patriotism. The Knights of Columbus truly surge with service. For more information, contact your local council or write We Believe, Post Office Box 50654, Nashville, Tennessee, 37205. That's We Believe, Post Office Box 50654, Nashville, Tennessee, 37205. Now, back to our program. Ah, we're all together once again with some questions. <laughs> right. And right. I'm certainly hoping some answers. I'm Pat Ryan, your moderator, and you've been having a very lively discussion on this Kinda got very that interesting... I can't get it through to him, though. You know, the a, camera crew, they don't... I'm a slow learner, I guess. Yeah. Well... I think we're going to get a chance to get in, right. into some more of that exact same thing that All you were talking about. Like, for instance, our first question kind of leads into where you were coming from in your earlier discussion. Are we all born saved? Yeah. Is, that, is that how we start out our life and, and then we have to turn our back on it or something in order to not be saved? Well, let me or tell how you do we what I understand. Say. He's dying to Let me yeah. tell you what I understand him to be saying. Okay. Maybe. And if I'm wrong, tell me. <laughs> Apparently, what he is saying is that there, are, there is a lot of thinking out there that unless you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're going to go to hell. Is that what you're saying? And, and that the solution to it is to believe, somehow believe. All right. So, but that's so we're not born saved. We've <laughs> well, got to, to make that decision. Well, the Catholic the Church point. doesn't that's, believe that. Is that where we're at? The Catholic Church has something called baptism of desire. <coughs> Excuse me, where you might be a Buddhist monk and cooperate. A Buddhist monk. A Buddhist monk. I'm going to have to have a drink of water here in a minute. But <laughs> if you cooperate with God's grace, you can possibly be saved. You may never have heard of Jesus Christ. But what I think Richard is saying is there is a lot of thinking out there that unless you go through this conversion experience that you're lost. Now, is that what yeah. you're saying? And, and, and it includes a good many things like uh, uh, an interpretation of the 14th chapter of John where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And that therefore you have to pray all prayers and include the name Jesus because the prayers go to Jesus and he takes them to God. And you end up with a dualism of, uh, uh, of the divine, uh, the, the Trinity ceases to be one God and becomes three, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and Christianity, does, nor does Judaism or Islam, have the idea of three gods. It's one God, three yeah. persons. And, and we, we need to do a show on that, too. But, but what I'm getting at is my answer to your question, yes, we're born saved, and you've got to do something to get rid of it before you, you know. Uh, and I know that's misleading, yeah. and it sounds crazy. But my point is, and this is really what I'm trying to say is, that Jesus came to this earth to show us the face of God. That's also in the 14th chapter of John. And that the nature of God is that His compassion surrounds us every instant, every moment of our lives from birth. And it's not God's plan for us to go to hell. He's not sitting there with some kind of wrath where we've got to obey a set of laws or a group of rules or join the right church or believe the right things or do our baptism just right or our worship just right. And if we don't, we're going to hell because He's sitting there anxious to throw us into eternal torment. That's not the God of Jesus Christ. We're surrounded by a compassionate God who is our loving parent. And if there is punishment, it's because we're free and we can reject Him. And that's what faith's about. It's involved in this freedom. And if, you know, the, the real point of it is that He's the loving parent that wills our salvation and that everything that is done to us, even hell, is for us, not against us. All right, I want to follow up on this. Okay. This is a deep point. We both have a lot of questions. First of all, I do not believe that we are born saved. Let me say uh -huh. that. I do not believe that this we are born saved. 
The reason I do not believe that we're born saved is I think it requires something on our part. I think we have a God who wills the salvation of all people. The gift is out there under the Christmas tree. But you don't believe that about an infant. Well, I get to the infants later. I get to the infants well, but later. But that's where you're born. No. Well, we're talking about an adult. <laughs> Wherever you're born, you grow up. There is required, and I'll bet you believe this too, Richard. Given free will, a response is required on our part. We've got to go pick up that gift. Don't you believe that? Oh, I think we've got to so, pick up the gift and use it. And I think the whole process is a growing in the process and, of love. And it's a mystery, though, mm -hmm. because there is human, there is freedom of the will somehow. It sounds strange to say it, but God needs our cooperation. God needs our loving response to his loving invitation. And if we don't learn that process of loving, then we can never be with God. Now, let me take it a little further afield. Uh, I would not say you have to... If we Christians don't go over to Timbuktu or wherever it is and tell the people that it's necessary, that Jesus Christ is God, and it's our fault that they go to hell. I can't believe that. Mm -hmm. So we believe as Catholics that if you have a notion of God as, as kind of confused as it might be, you do your best, try to conform. That's the free will. Try to conform your actions to what you believe that God wants. Then you've got what we call baptism of desire, even though you've never heard of Jesus Christ. Now, go so, ahead. Uh, all right, because this is really... I, Nobody's going to believe He's got this a burning example. desire. But yeah. as if, if I, I'm a little baby, I'm born as a baby, and I, I have grace and I'm saved. Mm -hmm. uh. And nobody's going to believe that, but we'll just have to go with that for the moment. And then what I'm doing through my life is following a path. And there are a, all kinds of mm. other paths that I could take and all that kind of thing. And part of my learning, part of what I am taught regarding all the lessons of life, but as far as the religious lessons of life, is that this is probably not a good way to go, this is the wrong way to go, don't go this way, that kind of thing. And each one of those are the teachings of God, Jesus Christ, the church or whatever. And if I deliberately or unknowingly take a wrong path, then I'm turning my back on salvation and making my own choice of sinning. And you can choose and, hell. And, but I can also, and I can choose hell, or I can choose to get back on the path. Well, right. he said something about Is that about Protestant it? or Catholic? Remember that <laughs> what I'm getting it? at is that when I talk about being born saved, I'm trying to reject the idea that we're born under God's wrath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And right. that somehow we have to get His grace. It's yeah. there. It's already yeah. there. And the baby that dies doesn't go to hell. Well, you know, let me just it's say God's this. God's plan that we all enter into this growing process to learn more and more about the, 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 the love of God, the love of fellow human being, and that that's what our lives, that's our purpose in life, is to learn this process of becoming uh, in fellowship with God. Well, Richard, you're back to baptism, which we've had you know, a session on it, but it's very difficult to say a six-month-old child that dies at that point tries to conform his will and his, his desire to whatever God wants because the child may be hardly aware of himself, much less a supreme being. So the Catholic Church must take other avenues to, to try to contend that child is saved. <coughs> now you might say, God said, Christ said, suffer little children to come unto me. That's true. But he also said, unless one is born of the water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we also have certain ways that we try to say that perhaps he has an instantaneous illumination and can choose God. Am I going to get to say anything about the crack Shriver made earlier, the very opening remark about Catholics going out and, and uh, doing something? It's and, true, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's true, isn't it? I made the comment just... about you can get back on the path. Is that... <laughs> What you I said that say. the Protestant, you know, I don't. rehash the Protestant Saturday concept night, right. is that Catholics yes. all they have to do is go to confession and they got God's forgiveness. Well, or that they think that, and the Protestants have rebelled yeah. against that idea. Well, I think that's why we threw out penance. Well, I guess that's probably yeah. yeah. Well, that's not true. One of the main essences of contrition or penance is 
to try to reform your life, a firm purpose of amendment. If you can't go in Harry's bar without getting drunk, you've got to stay out of Harry's bar. Go to Joe's bar. If you can't go to Joe's bar without getting drunk, stay away from all places where you might fall into sin. And a con firm purpose of amendment is a commitment too. You got to have that for confession. It's like a recovering alcoholic yeah, makes a commitment not right. to go back into bars. And, and you know, that's the idea, and that's that's the way it works. But and anyway, all of this has to do with the love of God. That's what we're talking about yes. when we talk about penance. And the love is there to start with. This fascinating discussion yeah. that we've just had on this subject. Thanks for being here and straighten us out. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to keep us on the straight and narrow because Saturday night's coming up soon, right? <laughs> <laughs> Right. I thank you both for being well, with us, and, uh, pleasure. and we hope to be back soon again. Okay. Thank you. You have been watching We Believe, a discussion of God's Word and religious belief as presented by your host, Mr. Jim Walsh, a deacon in the Roman Catholic Church, and his guest, Dr. Richard Shriver, a United Methodist minister. Today's program has been brought to you by a grant from your local Knights of Columbus Council. The Knights of Columbus is a paternal order of Catholic men dedicated to the service of God and neighbor. Last year alone, the Knights provided over $109 million and 55 million volunteer hours helping those in need. The Knights of Columbus truly surge with service. Deacon Walsh and Dr. Shriver would like to hear from you if you have questions you would like answered or topics you want discussed. Or if you would like a free booklet giving further information about the topics considered today, write We Believe, Post Office Box 50654, Nashville, Tennessee, 37205. That's We Believe, Post Office Box 50654, Nashville, Tennessee, 37205. Visit our website at www.webelieveshow.org. That's www.webelieveshow.org. Our email address is jimwalsh at webelieveshow.org. When you write, be sure to mention the number of the program. Today's program title is 850 Reconciliation Part 2. Thanks for watching. God bless you.